I want to share uh, just something really quickly, uh, and it applies to everyone, um, because all of us are children, sons, and daughters to a father, singles, you're hoping to get married. Uh, if you're a female single, uh, what kind of man are you going to marry? Uh, what kind of husband and father will it be to single men? What kind of father are you going to be and husband? Uh, that you're going to be when you get married as well as well as uh, married folks. So it applies to the whole nine yards. So uh, it's going to be from Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 and 22 to 25. 1 Samuel chapter 2, 12 through 17 and 20 to 25. Let's all stand up for the reading of God's holy word. As in our church, we have a tradition that we honor God's word by reading it out, uh, um, reading it uh, by standing up. I'll read it out loud since the long past. I'll read it out loud if you silently read along. We also have it up on the screen. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 and then skipping on down to 20 to the 25. Let me read aloud God's holy word. If you're on the same page with me, let me know by saying amen. Okay? Amen. Let me read aloud God's holy word. Eli's sons were scoundrels. Point of someone say, that's a strong word, okay? <laughs> Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priest that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand, um, while the meat was being boiled, and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whenever the fork brought, whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This was instituted by God to provide for the priest. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was born, uh, burned, I'm sorry, the priest servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. So if the person said to him, let the fat be burned first, then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Everybody say with contempt, okay? Now Eli, verse 22, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, I shout, however, okay, did not listen to their father's rebuke for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Before you sit down on this Father's Day, I want to just bring to you the sermon title idea of what is a good father? What is a good father? What is a good father? Everybody take your right in this finger, stretch high to the heavens above. We like to be participatory in our uh, Sunday service. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now receive it and with co conviction point to at least three other people and say it like a mean it. Ask that question, what is a good father? Find three people, make eye contact and say, what is a good father? What is a good father? What is a good father? You've heard me say this phrase, it's easy to become a father, but it's much more difficult to be a father. At that, a good one, at that. And you know, um, uh, fatherhood is a gift from the Lord, and I know that some of you also being sensitive are, are trying to become fathers, and we believe that um, uh, that's a desire that God gave to you. We're praying with you that the Lord will grant that. Can I get an amen to that, right? And, uh, but becoming a father and being a good father are two different things, and it's very, very difficult, especially the second part of that. And I just want to share a funny story about how um, God knows everything and plans everything and doesn't waste things. And this story goes that the number of children you have was corresponding to each of these dads, their work employer, uh, his names and all that. So there were three young fathers who were in the waiting room at a hospital. And as they're waiting, um, the first uh, father, young father to be, was told that his wife gave birth to twins, to twins. And so the man was amazed and said, man, I play baseball for the Minnesota Twins. Later, the nurse came out and told the second man, congratulations, you are the father of triplets. You have three kids. And he said, this is amazing. I work for 3M Corporation. And then the third man next to him, the third guy fainted right there. When he woke up, they asked him, what's wrong? He said, I work for 7-Up. This is not good news. So I want to share this with you, the fact that, um, you know, what is a good father? It's easy to become a father, but it's so much harder, as Brother James mentioned, to be a good father at that. 
And so I want to share with you what is truly a good father, biblically speaking, in that way. I want to share with you just quickly these things, and I hope that you'll take it to heart, because uh, as fathers, I really feel, even in the Christian church, we've lost true identity as men. We've lost it because we think it's just kind of doing what the bare minimum of what a father should be, but I want to go a little deeper than that in terms of what the Bible ascribes to what really is a good godly father in God's eyes, not according to man's eyes. The first thing I want to share with you is that a good father loves and fears God first. Everybody say, loves and fears God first. Fears. Say it even louder. Loves and fears God first, okay? Uh, tongue twister. What do we get this? In verse 12, it says, Eli's sons were scoundrels. I know the Bible is truth, but man, the Bible is so blunt in this verse. I mean, he's talking about Eli, the high priest, whose sons were priests serving at church. And the Bible describes them, Eli's sons were scoundrels, for they had no regard. Everybody say, no regard, okay? No regard for the Lord. And as Proverbs 9, 10 says, if you want to be wise, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I want to challenge all of you aspiring fathers to be or aspiring dads. One of the best things that you need to model is not only being successful at work, but model what it means that they, your children and your wife see that you love God more than anything else. More than your job. More than your toys. More than money. More than success or a title at work. That your family, your wife and your children see that you love God more than anything. Everything else is a distant second. Can I get an amen to that? And not only loves God, but they fear God. Everybody say, fear God, okay? That your children see, man, my father really loves God, but also fears and respects him in that way. And I know that we have the idea of fear, that fear, we should fear God, and there's a proper aspect of it, because we should fear God because he is holy, and he is righteous, and he's a just God. And we should have that proper fear. There are two aspects of fear. One is respecting his justice. It's kind of like this. You know, I know that none of you do this, and I'm confessing to you as a pastor, I do this at times. You're driving in the car, and you have your phone on the, uh, the car phone holder, and then a message notification pops up. And the temptation comes, don't touch it. And you're thinking, oh, it's okay, it's just one little thing. And then you touch it, and you're at a stoplight, and this happened to me, a police car pulled over right to my side. And I was like, put my finger down right now. And I looked at the police officer. Thank God he wasn't looking at me. It's like that, you know, when you know that you need to have a fear when the police officer comes and he's taught me that he would carry out uh, a justice because what? Out of law, he has to do it. But I want to let you know the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. But we need to fear God for the fact that when we mess up, God doesn't do it just because of law. He does it out of love. That's why the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. When God disciplines us, when humans, like a police officer, does, he does it out of law. But when God disciplines us like a father, he does it out of love. So I could trust him that his discipline is always what's best for me. Can I get an amen to that, right? So there's that aspect of fearing his justice. But then the other aspect is a reverence, is a respect. Respect and reverence. You respect God. And you, your children and your wife see that you revere and you respect and honor God in all that you do. So wherever you go, well, all your actions, you're doing it to honor God in that way. That you fear him, but you respect him. That wherever I go, I am God's representative. I'm going to respect him through and through. And today, we live in a culture where respect is thrown out the window. Kids don't know how to respect elders and vice versa. And that whole idea, wherever in our society, you, don't, you find someone that disagrees with you, you totally diss them right there. If you dis they disagree with you, you defriend them on Facebook. And you do all the like. But the aspect is, as men of God, as fathers and husbands, we need to show people and show our children that we are men of honor. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. You will do the honorable thing when everybody else is doing the dishonorable thing. That you will honor God and say, even when no one's watching, I'm going to honor God. Because you know why? God will always afford a chance. Your kids are watching whether you know they're watching you or not. And so to be able to live that life, to fear God and love God first as a result. So I want to just remind you to what it means to be a godly father. They see that you love God, you worship him, that you're going to live your life for him, and you re revere and respect him through and through. Can I get an amen, right? So that's the first thing I want to share with you. But it doesn't stop there because it talks about spiritual leadership, that we lead, we provide. 
We protect for our families. But how many of us really need to provide the spiritual leadership that God wants us to show? The second thing is something that I want to share with you is the fact that a godly father, a good father, loves and cherishes his mother. And all the women said, Amen. Loves and cherishes the mother. And where do I get this? In verse 20 it says, Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how his sons were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. How could a high priest's sons act this way? One, one, he wasn't a good father parenting them and correcting them. And two, they probably got an indication how the father and the mother their relationship was. And you know what's amazing? If you Google this up, I, 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 had a, I have a book about 25 anointed ministers of the gospel who had lousy marriages. And this book talks about these men that were used mightily of God, but their marriages were terrible. The wife didn't even love the husband and all that. And so you could be successful in work and ministry and all that, but your marriage isn't right there, and your children are going to be in the repercussion, the victims as a result of that. And it says here to love and cherish the mother. This is something what a good father does. You know, there's a phrase that says the best gift you can give to your children is to love the mother. And that is true. I said that quote before as well, but as I was thinking about it, that's not totally accurate to you. The best, the first and best gift you can give to your children is to show that you love God first. But then the second gift is that you love and you cherish your wife in front of your kids more than anything else. That's what they need because where else are they going to see a model? I'm not saying for a perfect marriage, but they need to see a real, real life marriage that experiences difficulty but overcomes it with love. Not a perfect marriage that they never have in any argument. And I shared this before when I was in seminary. There was a staff at seminary that said, me and my husband have been married for 30 years and we never had an argument. I remember everyone in the class, they dropped what they were doing, they looked at them. And I was thinking, there is no way you couldn't have an argument. But they said, honestly, we, don't, we didn't have a single argument in our 30 years of marriage. And I thought, define argument. They never answered that question, by the way. But you know one of the best things you can do? How do you love? I know we want to provide for our kids, but let's be honest. Some of your marriages are only together because for the sake of your children. If it wasn't for your kids, you would have divorced long ago. Can I encourage you? That's not God's plan for you. God wants you to have the healthiest marriage that blows all the Hollywood movies away. It means that, yes, you're going to go through arguments, you're going to go through difficulties, you're going to go through sickness, you're going to go through financial duress, but love conquers all things. And God's love conquers it. And it's not Hollywood's version of they fall and then they see each other and fireworks like 4th of July pops up. And they, your children, if they don't see that the husband loves the wife unconditionally with God's love, they're going to try to get their model examples through Hollywood and through other means. But it's a wonderful thing for us to be able to show that no matter what, even though your marriage isn't perfect, you will still show love and you will cherish your wife. Pastor, I have a hard time talking with my wife. Let me be honest with you, man. You have a hard time talking to begin with. You know, we all know the studies that men average 25,000 words a day. And women average 40,000 words a day. That's a difference of 15,000 words. So by the time men come home, they already used 24,999 words at work. And when they come home, their wife is waiting to share everything and, and for the husband to share, and they just want to clam up. And I know for many of you men, you come home from work and you just had a stressful day. You just want to chill out and isolate. But let me challenge you, spiritual leadership it's not just isolating and being passive about it. You need to still engage because you're still the spiritual leader of your home. And you need to be there. And you need to, whether you feel like to cherish your wife. You know, uh, my wife found this on social media. I'm going to show this how, in terms of how you need to really cherish and really speak to your wife, not just buy things for her, not just do things with the kids with, with your wife, but to really show your kids that I cherish, not just love, but cherish my wife. As the Bible says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Pastor, my wife is really just one grumpy person. Well, maybe, I want to say this, maybe it's because she might be a reflection of how you've been treating her. Sometimes a marriage, because the Bible says, as Christ loved the church, cleansed her, 
purified her and built her up to present her before God. That means your wife may be a reflection of what you should have done but didn't do, maybe reflecting back because I know you are saying, but pastor, I should get the love and respect for my wife too. Yes, but may I also say this, you're the leader of the household. Lead by example. Can I get an amen from the women? So whether they give it to you or not, you're supposed to still love them as Christ loved the church. The church doesn't always love Jesus all the time, but he still loves and gives himself. And when you do that, you speak and you cherish her. Do the things that show to your kids, man, my dad really adores my mom. That's one of the best gifts you can ever give. I, sh I shared this before with a couple of the folks. I, I have a wonderful pastor friend who used to pastor out here, but he's now out in the East Coast. And when we would travel together, we were there in Dallas, Texas one time, and we were, we had this, uh, we were hanging out, and, and I said, Pastor, um, I heard you've been traveling. You've been gone from your f uh, family for like about several weeks. Don't you miss your, your, uh, your family, your kids, and your wife? And then he looked at me and said, yeah, I miss my wife only. I said, huh? You don't miss your kids? He goes, oh, I love my kids, I miss, but I miss my wife so much. And at the time, I just had my little you know, kids that were young. I'm like, man, I, I miss my wife too, but I miss my kids. And, you know, I didn't understand what he meant by that. But, you know, just this past January, uh, we had a missions team go to Thailand. I think it was Brother Eddie asked, like, hey, Pastor, do you miss your family? And I said, you know what? I miss my wife. <laughs> don't give me, I miss my kids, but I really miss my wife. And that's what it means. You know what? Some of you love your kids more than your spouse. Can I be honest and raw with you? The Bible does not command husbands love your children as Christ loved the church and gave us. It says love your wife. Because when there's proper order, I'm not saying don't love your kids. You're going to love them with God's unconditional love. But when they see that the marriage Husband and wife, your kids are going to get married one day. They need to love God first and so love each other as a spouse. That provides stability and peace in the home. When the kids see that mom and dad love each other first and foremost, they feel secure. But when the, when the kid feels, I feel that my mom and dad love me more than my mom or dad, that's disorder right there. Because then the kids think, I am the center of the universe. I get whatever I want. But when the parents see that they love each other, there's order. You try with me. Can I get an amen, right? But my wife found this on social media, and it's so funny about how men, we, we communicate. That's about a phone log. Can we show the first, uh, first clip, please? It says, um, phone log, boy to boy, 58 seconds. Boy to mom, 45 seconds. Boy to dad, 20 seconds. All right, really short there. Boy to girl, one hour, 13 minutes, and 59 seconds. Girl to girl, two hours, 35 minutes, and 20 seconds. Husband to wife, three seconds. Mom to married daughter, four hours, five minutes, and 15 seconds. I think that's pretty kind of accurate, right? But let me show the next slide, which is really funny. Husband to wife. 12 mixed calls. Oh, it's my wife. Reply. Oh, can't talk right now. Reply right there. And you know when you're doing that? But you know what's so funny? If your kid calls, you would answer right away. That shows that we prioritize our kids. And don't get me wrong. Oh, the youth are like, what? Pastor's saying don't, I'm not important. No, you are important. But the healthiest thing is your son and your daughter, husbands, need to see. Not you're doing it fakely, like watch son, look. And you're fake, but to be genuine. Show that you cherish your wife. That she is no other woman in the world that was best for, her, for you than your wife. Can I get an amen to that? And I know she may not seem that way. Pastor, you don't know how she talks to me when we're alone. You still cherish your pastor. We've been married 20 years. Look how she looks. Well, I'll say, look how you look right now after 20 years. 
You've been eating too much in and out. It came in and it out came out your wife's line. So remember that and let's really try to show what true love brings to build. I guarantee you this. If you start to cherish your wife, there will be more peace and stability in the home. Because as one person said, Satan's schemes are twofold. One is to sever the relationship between the husband and wife. And then by doing that, the second scheme is to sever the relationship from the son and the, from the father and the children. So sever the relationship, husband and wife, and then the father to the children. And it starts by attacking the first one right there. So I want to challenge all of you. Let's cherish and love all the mothers. Can I get an amen from all the brothers right now? Can I get an amen to that, right? The third thing that I want to share with you about what it means to be a godly father is about, about the fact that we need to uh, fathers proactively. Everybody say proactively, okay? And not passively. Everybody say passively, okay? We have a lot of passive fathers these days, and I know that there are two clusters today. There are the fatherless, and these are the people that, God forbid, it's unfortunate, you might have lost your father, might have passed away early on, and therefore you're fatherless. But then the other cluster says they have fathers, but these fathers father less than they should be doing. It's two words. So fatherless, those who don't have a father. And then there's fatherless, two words, those who are fathers, but they're not proactive, they're passive. And as a result of that, they don't do the things that God has called them to be. It says here in verse 22, Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. What I mean by this in terms of proactive or passive fathering is this. Eli was an example of a father who was present, not an absentee dad, but who was present, but he was permissive. He permitted his sons to continue to do things that weren't right. Why? Maybe because he just wanted them to, be, to, to, them to like him or to be their friend in that way. So he just kind of more or less threw out the aspect of as a father, as the Bible says, a father who really loves disciplines his children. Can I get an amen to that? Because if you're not disciplined, the Bible says, you are illegitimate children of God. So God disciplines out of love. And that's why I've, I shared this example before. If your kid is doing something really disrespectful and out there, I might say, stop it. But that's all I'll say. But if it was my kids doing that, and I told them to stop it, and they keep doing it, you know what I would do? I would take them by the hand, take them to a corner, and ground them for the next whole year or so. So it's a matter of not just being uh, passive about it, but taking it to another level and discipline in that way. And what Eli did was this. His sons were priests. And I don't know what he did, uh, why would make him do this, but he would actually, he heard reports that your sons are sleeping around with the women. And they're stealing the best parts that were supposed to be re, uh, offerings to God. They actually defiled offerings to God. And can I encourage you, every Sunday we gather together, we're supposed to give the best of the best to God. The priests were trying to steal it away. His sons were. Give us the choicest por portions right there. But I want to let you know, what we give to God, your worship, your time, your attention, is to be the best unto God as a result. And his sons were uh, serve, serving wickedly, but all Eli does is give them a verbal rebuke. Tell them to stop. When as the high priest, he should have lovingly disciplined and said, you're not serving as priests anymore. But he allowed them to continue. And as a result, the Lord's justice came upon them in that way. So Eli was very successful. But he was a passive father who permitted these things to happen. Another example I want to share with you, we don't have on the Bible screen, uh, on the screen here, is the example of David, King David. Everybody say David. Okay. David was the greatest king of Israel. And yet, he failed miserably as a father. He did one good thing, though. He raised Solomon, one of his sons, properly. But all his other sons, he was, a, he was an absentee dad. He wasn't really there for them because he had so many wives and so many concubines. And as a result, he permitted things to happen. And then when finally, for instance, Abnon, one of his older sons, raped one of his half-sisters, David's daughters, David 
I don't know why. Maybe he was too busy at work. Maybe he was too tired from being a king. He didn't discipline Amnon, his son. As a result, Absalom, David's other brother, who was the full brother to Tamar, who, was, who had been raped, he was so angry that his father didn't discipline and do the right thing. And he harbored all this bitterness. And as a result, God didn't discipline, uh, 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 David didn't discipline Amnon, his son, and Absalom, his other son, got bitter as a result. And then later on, Absalom schemed and he killed his brother, Amnon, David's son. And then what does David do then? He finally decides to discipline. But when he does, he disciplines and doesn't build a relationship, but breaks the build relationship with Absalom. So he just confines him right there. So Absalom, actually, the story goes, he rebels against his father, and then his father's all fleeing from the throne, and his Absalom's son has sons with all of David's concubines and public and father to shame his father in that way. It's a whole mess as a result. And I want to say this because many of us are great in providing, protecting for our families. But like I said, you need to love God first, but also cherish and love your, wi your wife in front of your kids, but also not be passive about it, but to be proactive. You need to have the guts to show spiritual leadership. Can I get an amen? amen? We need men, and that's why we're at this church. We want you to not just be a father, but to be a spiritual leader of your household, to hear from God and to do the right thing, even though it's the hardest thing to do. And that's why uh, at, at our church, I want to just say this, as a church, we want to be honest and real and raw, and we want to be people that are proactively engaging one another. And you have my word on this, that we will always do the right thing, not to please you, but to please God as a result. So all you fathers, I want to challenge you today, lovingly, we want to honor you, be a good father. Your son or daughter needs you right now. They don't need just more gifts. They need you to spend time with them to hear what they're going through, to see what they're interested in. You know, it's hard for me. My son listens to praise music. He loves, but at the same time, he listens to some, some, you know, songs that a teenager would be. Drake. I'm tempted to call him Rake all the time, but Drake. And I remember hearing one song. It was one of the older songs. I only want my mommy, my daddy. Oh, three. Give me here all that, and my son's like, what are you doing, Dad? And I'm like, you know what, son, I'm trying to listen to what you, and I try to find out what's going on. And he's like, Dad, you're old. <laughs> you're getting old school on me here. And, you know, and I said, you know what, that's true, but you know what, I want to challenge you fathers. Be proactive. Don't just think that they're going to come out right. You need to be hands-on as men, as fathers, to mold and shape your sons and daughters. You know, dad over the years is regarded by kids in the following way. As your kids are at a certain age, I found this quote, that when your kids are four years old, my daddy can do anything. But when your kids are eight years old, they start saying, daddy doesn't know. When they're 12 years old, oh, well, naturally, father doesn't understand. When they're 14 years old, father, hopelessly old-fashioned. When they're 21 years old, oh, that man is out of date. What would you expect? When your kids are 25 years old, he comes with a good idea now and then. When your kids are 30 years old, must find out what dad thinks about it. When they're 35 years old, a little patience, let's get dad's input first. When your kids are 50 years old, what would dad have thought about that? And when your kids are 60 years old, I wish I could talk it over with my dad once more. Our kids are allotted to us a certain time. And we're never going to be able to hold on to them forever. And that's something that I want to challenge you. And young people, you think, dad's outdated and all that. And you know what? I'm 50 years old now, too. I'm just being raw and honest with you. It's humbling to get old. My, my son used to think that I could do anything. Now he realized he could beat me in everything in sports. The other Monday, we, uh, kids are out of school. We were at, at the beach. And my son's like, dad, you want to race me? Why do you want to erase me? I know you're already faster than me. <laughs> Come on, Dad. This is... Why, you want to rub it in your daddy's face that you're faster than me? Okay, I admit it. You're faster than me. Come on, Dad. Then he's trying to get his mom. Come on, Mom. Why don't you erase me too? <laughs> and you know, there's a temptation like, why am I dealing with, you know, you're faster than me. Okay, I admit it. You, what are you? And then it just hit me like, my son actually still wants to spend time with me. Because later on, he may not want to do it. So I said, okay, let's do this. 
I gave my smartphone for my, to my wife, and my wife video recorded. I'm like, oh, no. You think, don't post this on social media. And she did post it on social media. <laughs> we take off, and my son beats me and all that. And my son's like, good job, Dad. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, I want to provide the best for my son. Living here in Orange County, you want to... But you know what? What your kids need more than anything else, not some name brand designer thing. Yeah, if you can, give it to them, but don't let them become the center of their lives. What they need is God in the center of their lives. And second, closely, they need a father that's godly, who's interested and proactive in their lives. Can I get an amen to that? So if you give things to your kids but not spending time with them, how are you going to mold and shape them to be the God has called them to be? So be proactive. Point of someone say, don't be passive, don't be passive, don't be passive. The final thing I want to share with you as I close is simply this. You know, um, we need to train our children, our family for godly success. Can I get an amen to that, right? Yeah. We want them to set, we, but most of the time we want to set them up for good success. And I'll be quick as I end this. You know, um, I'm sure you heard the news recently. These celebrities committing suicide. Kate Spade. Some of you have her purses. You women, that is. I hope none of you men have their, uh, her purses. She committed suicide. Anthony Bourdain. And I'll be honest, I love food. I love to travel. I'm thinking, man, what a dream job. I don't know his latest show from CNN, you know, what was it? Uh, uh, no Borders. But I, I used to watch his other show on Travel Channel, whatever it was. Uh, no Reservations. He could travel. He could stay at the nicest hotels, eat all this food. What a job. He's a best-selling New York Times best-selling author. He has money, fame, and all these things. And yet, these people, for whatever reason, for depression, and I treat depression seriously. It is a disease. And it is despairing. I want to be very sensitive to that. But these people had everything that the world says, this is what will make you successful and full of contentment and joy and yet they had a depression a void in their heart and their mind that money fame popularity security all these things pleasure could not fill a void in their heart can i be honest with you the reason why only christ can fill that void all the money all the riches cannot give you that contentment and so these people had all the god uh, the good success but then they ended up taking their lives and as I close, I want to challenge you fathers. You want to get the best things for your kids. You want to train them, to let them go to good schools, all these things. I'm going to ask you, don't just give them good things so they'll be successful in their jobs. Teach them this. It's when they pursue godliness, goodness follows along. But when they follow goodness, godliness does not follow. They need to not just pursue a, a successful good life. They need to pursue a godly life. And the blessings of God will follow through. Can I get an amen to that? I say this as I close. You know, I have huge dreams and aspirations for my kids. I want them to see better than me. And I know you want your kids to do better than you. I rejoice when my son beats me in a race. I'm not egotistical. So competitive. Oh, I got to beat my son. He doesn't know this, but I'm saying it now. When he was younger, when I was taller than him, I let him beat me in basketball. I know some of your dads are like, ooh, get that out of here. I'm teaching some humility, boy. <laughs> but I would let my son score, and he's like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm like, so every once in a while, I'll be like, man, squat it. But then I started letting him, because you know why? I want my kids to succeed. And you know, in this rat race, where as my kids get older in high school, now the, the conversation is college, 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 college. You see schools, 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 you see schools. Oh, you see schools, you see Berkeley, you see LA, you see SD, you see Riverside, you see, oh, you see, you see, you see. And I'm like, I'm being from the East Coast, so what? It's a state school. <laughs> Let's put it in perspective. And can I say this? Your kid's future is not based upon a college. It's based upon God. God used Jesus, who wasn't educated, like they say in the inner city churches, 
And yet God, you raised them up to be wise. It's not their background, who's, but rather who they're resting on. God can take them places more than any school. And so I want Karis to do well. And I know that, you know, with her, especially in this background, my wife and I will, God, what is your plan for our daughter? How, is she going to get like a job, especially needs like working at a grocery store, like bagging bags? But whatever it is, I know this. God has the best plans for my daughter. And I want to teach her more than just getting a nice job of success. I want her to love God and know God personally. I want her to know that whatever job she's doing, that God didn't make any mistakes in her life. That even no matter how the world sees her, oh, you have this or that, that she knows her identity is not from her job or good success, but from God himself. I pray for my son. That he would be a good man that loves God. Yeah, I pray that he'll be successful. We have a nice job so he could take care of his parents, of course. <laughs> but more than that, I ask, am I letting him have a real relationship with God? Because when I'm gone, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it, the Bible says. Then when I'm gone, I'm asking myself, is my son still going to love God? Is he still going to live for him? Is he still going to try to be a man of honor and integrity when our society is falling apart? Am I teaching him not just to get things and provide that he could be set up to have a successful career, but just like Eli, his sons became successful priests, but they were lousy in their character. They didn't really revere God. But am I going to teach my son when I'm, done, when I'm gone and I'm up in heaven, I look down from heaven, I see my son who took the baton of faith and he's running it with double portion from that which he received from his parents. And I want to challenge all of us. We need to keep on passing on our faith and passing on the baton so that our children will do even more things than us. Can I get an amen to that? So teach them not just good success, but godly success, that they'll have a real relationship with God.